Good morning. We continue uh, our This Is My House series. So it's football season. And so when someone says, this is my house, you know, they're talking about uh, not being hospitable and you not being welcome here, right? But in the Christian idea, this is my house. It is the direct opposite of the uh, stadium statement. It is, this is a place you are welcome. This is the place you are invited. This is the place you are received. And so we're talking about the Christian virtue or characteristic of hospitality. How from Genesis all the way through, God is doing two things. One, he's inviting us to be received. And then he's looking for those who will receive. All right, and you can go all the way from Genesis all the way through, and you see this movement going through. And so today, we're going to be talking about hospitality and how it is required for leadership. So think about that. So I'm like, I don't, you know, look at the news and then pick on what I'm going to talk about, all right? So uh, these sermons are planned months in advance. And in our culture today, leadership has everything to do with power. It has everything to do with uh, notoriety. Uh, It has everything to do um, with all the attributes that are inconsistent with Christian virtues. It's ironic that we have the leadership in our lives that we accept. We have the leadership in our lives that we tolerate. And what Jesus is saying is, I want you as Christian leaders, I want you to lead with character. And one of the characteristics I want you to lead with is this characteristic called hospitality. So when I grew up, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. And our house was always full of strangers, just always. We'd come home, and it'd be Thanksgiving, and At the end of the table would be some guy in an Air Force uniform, and my mom would be like, okay, children, meet Corporal so-and-so. He's from such and such a place, and he's here, and he doesn't have family, and so we thought we'd invite him over to our house. And all the kids would be like, oh, great, we're having Thanksgiving with a stranger. And that was just normal. That was just normal in our home. And so it's funny, um, yeah, I used to be that kid, and now my kids are going, really, Dad, do we have to have another person we don't know over to the house? And it's just who we are. It's just what we do because we recognize that everyone needs an invitation. Everyone needs to know and love and accept. When you look around today, you probably met someone. This is San Antonio. You probably met someone who is new new to the city because of military, new to the city because of medical, new to the city because of education. I mean, this is a massive city of transient people. And everyone's looking to connect, and everyone's looking to know whom can they trust. Everyone's looking to find someone to connect with. And so when you talk about this idea of hospitality, what we said last week is hospitality is rooted in the character of God. And we know this because Jesus, in... Uh, Matthew, he's talking about the Olivet Discourse, and he says, you, when I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was hungry, you fed me. And the response is, when did we see you hungry, Jesus? And Jesus says, whenever you did this for the least of these, it is as though you were doing it to me. So Jesus redefines the stranger, and then we talked about the good Samaritan, who the the lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus then tells the story about the good Samaritan. So Jesus redefines the stranger, and he redefines neighbor. This is the Christian understanding. I want you to ask yourself the question, who is your neighbor? In other words, who are you responsible for? Most of us think about people we know or we think about family members. Those are the people that we'll invite in. Those are the people that we'll sacrifice a little bit to serve. But what Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. It's the person on the side of the road. The person you don't even know, the stranger. When you offered them water, you offered me water. That neighbor who is hurting that you don't know, not the one you do know, not the family member you do know, we have a hard enough time being nice to our family. 
much less a complete stranger. And this is the idea of hospitality. So in leadership, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the, the context is talking about who has the character to be a leader. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, it says, Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer. This is the term for elder. This is the term for pastor. This is the term we would just talk about as a leader in the church. He desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach. This is a person of good reputation, okay? Faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. And it goes on, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his household well. It goes on to give these lists of characteristics of a leader. Now, I've been a pastor for over 25 years, and I am in three groups presently, plus I meet with my elder board uh, twice a month. So really, there are four contexts uh, on a bi-weekly basis in which I am given uh, the opportunity to be held accountable. I have never been asked, are you hospitable? Have you had someone over to your house recently? Have you stopped and looked in on the hurting or the stranger? I've never been asked that. Now, I've been asked about my marriage. I've been asked about managing my household well. I've been asked about being quarrelsome or self-controlled. I've been asked some of those questions over the years. I have never once been asked, hey, man, how are you doing with your neighbors, with a stranger? Are you hospitable? Isn't that interesting that equal to being faithful to your wife, equal to not being a lover of money, equal to not being uh, un uncontrolled or uh, drunken, equal to those, Scripture says Christian leaders should be hospitable. They should be able to see the person who needs to be cared for and loved, and they should, with open arms, invite them to the table. This runs in direct opposition to our culture. If you notice what's happening in our culture, um, we're going through a, a season called uh, nationalism through the, the entire world. And what nationalism does, just like it did in, in World War II and in, in, in Nazi Germany, uh, nationalism causes us to, to close ranks. It causes us to be less open to outsiders. It causes us to be introspective. Me first. All right? And so it happens throughout history, and this is not just an American thing. This is a worldwide populist thing that is happening. These trends happen. And right now, we as a country are going through it. Our world is going through it. But we as Christians are not supposed to be caught up in the wave of the cultural whims of the world. We as Christians are supposed to maintain the character of Christ at all times. And we as Christians must continue to have open hearts to the stranger, open hearts to the infirmed, open hearts to the addicted, open hearts to the lonely, open hearts to the discarded. That's who we are called to be. We are called to live out the character of Christ. And hospitality is rooted in the character of God, and it is required for Christian leaders. Just imagine. Imagine if we didn't settle. Imagine if we required the people in leadership in our lives to model and lead by looking after the least of these by model and lead, by welcoming and inviting others in. I think our world would be a different place. We have to have the eyes to see and serve the Jesus that we see in others. Second thing he says here is in Romans 12, verse 9. Now the context of Romans 12 is about... Um, Offering yourself a living sacrifice. This is how we worship God as we offer ourselves to God. And then it talks about the spiritual gifts. And then right after talking about the spiritual gifts, each one of us who receives a gift, we all have spiritual gifts. He transitions to verse 9 where he says, love must be sincere. 
So what does sincere love look like? What does sincere love do? You hate what is evil. You cling to what is good. You're devoted to one another in love. You honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep in mind your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. Now here's the thing. We all know this. You practice what you're not good at. You practice what doesn't come natural to you. In that list of spiritual gifts just before, hospitality is one of the spiritual gifts. People are like, well, I just don't have the spiritual gift. Uh, 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 uh. We are all responsible for spiritual gifts that we do not have. And if you don't have the gift of hospitality, it's okay. Just start practicing it. Practice. Ask yourself this. When is the last time I practiced hospitality? Practicing hospitality could be like, okay, whenever a, there's a new kid at my school, I'm going to invite them to have lunch with me. That's going to be one of my practices. Whenever there's a new employee at work, I'm going to introduce myself to them, welcome them, and get, go out of my way to get to know them. Whenever there's a new person at my church, after service, I'm going to say, hey, would you like to go get lunch? And I'm going to take time to get to know them. Whenever there is a new person in my neighborhood, I'm going to bake some cookies and go over and say, if you need a list of doctors or you need some information or whatever, I'm here. Welcome to the neighborhood. Practice hospitality and pick something simple and pick something easy. I promise you, these little things change people's lives. Three years ago when we did the Believe series, my wife and I decided, well, we'll do the Believe series at our house and we'll invite our neighbors since it's multiple churches throughout the city doing this 30-week study. We'll just invite people in our neighborhood. So we sent a little Facebook thing out to the neighborhood, and they're supposed to meet at our house on Sunday night at 5 o'clock. Sunday night at 5 o'clock, people start coming to our house. And there's 15, uh, uh, 16 people that showed up. And they knock on the door, and I'd open the door, and I'm like, I didn't know this person. And I'm like, wait, I do know this person. I haven't seen you since the seventh grade. And that actually happened. I hadn't seen this gal since seventh grade, and she lives in my neighborhood and knocks on my door. And she goes, Jeff? And I said, Monica? And it was crazy. Well, then for the next 30 weeks, they meet in our house every Sunday evening for 30 weeks. At the end of 30 weeks, the study was done. And we said, okay, the study's done. And they're like, well, we want to keep meeting. And we're like, okay, that's fine, but let's try it at your house for a while. <laughs> right? And so what happened is they started alternating houses. And every time we would go to somebody else's house, the next week we would get an email or, or a phone call or a note that says, thank you so much. I didn't realize how much energy it took. What a gift you gave us. And so now we continue to meet house by house. These people that we didn't even know are now our friends. And over the three years, we've done some life together. Darren's no longer married, and he's raising three girls. And my girls and wife go over to help him raise his three girls because he's a, a single dad with three little girls. And they have to have their hair done, and they have to all this stuff. And so we jump in, and our other neighbor takes them to school each morning. When Darren got hit in the eyeball playing basketball and couldn't see, my wife went over to take care of his kids while I drove him to the ER. And this last month, one of our, our life group members, she had spine surgery, and she's in a neck brace. She can't drive. She can't lift anything over five pounds, so we're taking her food. My wife went over to just sit with her just to spend some time with her because she's, she's alone and hurting. It's just what people do who love people. Now, let me deal with all the reasons why you can't. Well, you know, Pastor Jeff, I, uh, I just can't afford to do that. Well, you know, Pastor Jeff, I don't really have a good, a, a large house. I mean, our house is really small, and we just, you know, 
well, my house, I, to get it cleaned up and everything. Listen, it is not about your house. Hospitality is about your heart. Mike and Cheryl Clemenson have been friends of mine for the last 25 years, and they live in Leon Valley. And they, their house was a little cinder block house, 1,200 uh, square feet. Now, they've added on since then. It's like 1,700 square feet now, and it's not cinder block. They put some rock on the outside and dressed it up over the last 25 years. But for 25 years, they have hosted people. Cheryl has discipled uh, uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers for about 20 years. Mike uh, taught the precepts course of verse by verse. They have held life groups in their home. I have been in their home hundreds of times. And over the past 20 years, literally thousands of people have been discipled and blessed and loved on in 1,200 square feet. It's not about the size of your house. It's about the size of your heart. Jody and I live in a 1,000 square foot little casita, and there are people in our home all the time. Ask my daughters. There's one bathroom. They're very much aware when people are over, all right? It's not about the size of your house. It's about the size of your heart. And the question is, who needs the invitation? Who needs to be included? Who needs to be loved and cared for? Who needs to be reached out to? At your school, at your office, at your church. Jody and I were driving yesterday, and I saw a girl with a backpack on, and she had a dog on a leash, and she was on the side of I-10. And so I looked at her, and I'm saying out loud, well... She's got a dog. It's a nice leash. And this is one of these huge backpacks. She's on the side of I-10. The dog looks in good condition. And you know what? She has a pair of Toms on, meaning she's not going very far. You know what a pair of Toms are? They're like little slippers. Right? There's not shoes that you wear across country. And I'm making this assessment at a red light, and I'm making this assessment quickly to know whether or not I'm going to treat her as my daughter or not. And I assess very quickly, she's fine, she's probably not going very far, she doesn't look like she's been on the road for years or weeks, Um, so I don't know what this is, maybe like a college thing, I'm not sure. And so we move on, but in that moment, I'm sitting there going, I may need to stop. I may need to give her a ride. I may need to buy her dinner. I may need to help her find a safe place because if that were my daughter, I would hope somebody else would do the same. And this is the lens through which we as followers of Christ must see the world. Irma. How many of y'all know Irma? She's like four foot three. I met Irma in South Africa on a mission trip. I would get up very early to have coffee, and Irma would already be up, because if you know Irma, she was doing her hair and makeup, all right? And so I would make coffee, and I'd make her a cup of coffee, and we became friends early in the morning when nobody else was awake, and we began to talk to one another. And Irma began to share her story with me, all foot, four foot three of her, estranged from her husband. She's a nurse, leads a, a, an office. She's raising daughters. One was one left that was left on her porch, who she took in and adopted as her own. In addition to being a nurse, sometimes on the weekends, she used to have a little barbacoa stand so she could make ends meet and she would cook. And so now we're in South Africa and she decides she wants to teach, treat them to Tex-Mex. And so this church of 120, 150 people, she cooks. And while she's cooking for them, she's training all of us how to make tortillas. She's like, tortillas have a right side and a wrong side. Did you know this? How many of you knew this? All right, no white people. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, seriously, like, they, like she's teaching us all how to roll them out, to flip them. We're making beans. We're making enchiladas. And we're, it's all, and she is this little four foot three general, and we feed 120 something people. So we come back. She also hosts a life group. She's a life group leader. We come back, and the next year, I say, you know what? We need a trip leader for South Africa. And everyone's like, who should we get? And I said, you ought to, Norma, Irma, Irma Irma ought to lead the group, lead lead the trip. So we call Irma and say, Irma, you you need to lead the South Africa trip. She goes, I'm not a leader. And I said, you are the very definition of a leader. When I opened the scripture, 
But I see someone who's humble. I see someone who's kind. I see someone who's loving. I see someone who's faithful and sacrificial and hospitable. You are the definition of a leader. And so now she leads people halfway across the world on mission trip. She's not the leader that we would pick. She's not the leader that would win an election. She's not the leader that you would, you know, she's, first, she's not the first pick on your basketball team, I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> but she meets every requirement of a biblical leader. Jesus models leadership for us when he's washing the feet of his disciples. First, he invites them to the upper room. He invites them, and he prepares a meal for them. And then he discards his clothes, and he washes their feet, and he says these words, I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus was a servant leader. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And what he says is, come, eat. I've prepared a meal for you. I've eagerly awaited to spend this time with you. Oh, and by the way, I want to serve you. And now because I have served you, I want you to turn around and do the same for others. He hosts them and then turns around and says, be a host. Be a servant leader. In the very next chapter, he says this, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. This is some of the most beautiful language in all of scripture. He says, don't be troubled. Whatever you're going through, the brokenness in your marriage, the, the addiction that you're experiencing, the, the woundedness in your heart, the anger and the unforgiveness, all of this stuff is, do not be troubled. I've got you covered. I go and I prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many rooms, and there's one with your name on it, so don't worry about it. I got it covered. I love this. Thomas says, we don't know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way. You just follow me. Place your faith in me. It's the ultimate picture of hospitality. I've built a house, and I've got a room with your name on it. Jesus is a servant leader. He's constantly inviting us in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's inviting us in, and he's inviting us to invite him in, and he's inviting us to invite us others to the table. Hospitality is rooted in the character of God. Those of us who follow Christ Jesus, we should exemplify the leadership of Christ in our lives and in the lives of others. So let me ask you some questions. When's the last time you opened your door it could have been at the cafeteria at school where you invited a friend, someone you didn't know to sit with you. It could have been when you stopped on the side of the road to help the stranger uh, change their, their, their tire. It could have been when you met a person here in church and, and they're from someplace else and they're the first timer here and you said, hey, how about we go to lunch and I'll, I'll try to get you plugged into a life group. Maybe you could come to our life group. When's the last time you met someone you didn't know and you looked at them as though they were Jesus, the stranger, the outsider, the hungry, the hurting, the lonely. Here's what I want you to know. If you're here today and you are hurting, you're struggling, you're alone, you've lost hope, Grace Point is called by God to be home. We don't want you to be alone. We don't want you to be isolated. We don't want you to be hurting. We don't want you to be stuck. We are committed to being followers of Christ who love with the love of Christ. 
if you're here today and you're not in the game, God's given you skills, God's given you heart, God's given you a passion. But don't come up with all those excuses of why you can't. Just be willing to open up your heart and open up your home, open up your life, and love on somebody. Be kind to somebody. Be generous to someone. Do unto them the way that you would want. If you're new in, a, in town, you don't know anyone, at the end of this service, our prayer team's going to be down front. If you're here and you're hurting, if you're here and you're alone, we want to get you connected. The other thing I want you to do, if you're a long-term Grace Pointer, you've been coming here and this is your church, you've been attending here, and you're not in the game, reach in front of you and grab that card, the next step card, and just say, Pastor, I want to get in the game. I want to get in the game. I'll be a life group leader. I'll open my home. I'll, I'll, I, I, I need to respond. Because here's the thing. Our culture and our world is dying because we are all turning inward. We're so worried about ourselves. We're so worried about our issues that the world is just rotting in isolation and loneliness. And Jesus has called us to extend his love and his grace to others. Hospitality is rooted in the character of God. And God expects his people to lead, to take people from here to there. Leadership is about taking someone from here to there. And there's people who are hurting and they need to go from hurting to healed. There's people that are lonely that need to go from isolation to community. There's people that are broken that need to go from brokenness to healing. And God has called his church to be a part of the leadership movement that takes people and embraces them and helps them heal and helps them grow and helps them experience uncommon life. Whether you know that or not, that's who you're called to be. And if you don't have that heart, practice it. Practice what you're not good at. Practice what doesn't come natural, and you will be blessed. I'm going to pray. We're going to close. And then if you want to pray with someone or talk to someone, our prayer team will come and stand down front. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would broaden our hearts, expand our capacity to love, give us the courage to step out of our comfort zone and see others. When we see a stranger, help us to see you. When we see a, someone hurting, help us to have compassion, the compassion that you would have. Help us, Lord, to get beyond our comfort zone. Embrace others and encourage them to be a part of your kingdom, to be a part of your family. There are many rooms in your Father's house Lord God, there's one with our name on it, but there's also one with our neighbor's name on it. Help us be the ones to tell them that good news. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you